I'm Femi OK. I'm Ahmed Shabuddin, and you're in the stream. Today, Barack Obama's global legacy. How did his presidency impact the world? All those watching tonight from beyond our shores, from parliaments and palaces, to those who are huddled around radios in the forgotten corners of the world, our stories are singular, but our destiny is shared. And a new dawn of American leadership is at hand. Barack Obama's 2008 election made waves around the world. Obama opposed the Iraq War and pledged to speak to U.S. enemies. He was the son of a Kenyan father who spent some of his childhood years in Indonesia. Even his own name, Barack Hussein Obama, was taken as a sign of a new U.S. foreign policy. On our last edition of AJ Stream, we looked at Obama's domestic legacy in the United States, and now we want to discuss his global impact. Joining us to talk about this, Trevor Thrall, he's senior fellow for the Cato Institute's Defense and Foreign Policy Department. Karen Atia is the global opinions editor at the Washington Post. Vijay Prashad is professor of international studies at Trinity College, and his latest book is The Death of the Nation and the Future of the Arab Revolution. And there's more? Yes, there's more. Our guests from yesterday's conversation on Obama's domestic legacy are listening in. Michael Denzel Smith, writer and author of the book Invisible Man, got the whole world watching. Michael Day is author of Obama's Legacy, What He Accomplished as President. And Sarah Jaffe, journalist and author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt. Let me share with you part of this tweet from Michael Ogia. He ends his tweet saying the U.S. government should stop illegal drone strikes, exclamation mm -hmm. mark. A government that allows drones and killings to happen without due process, Fiji. Uh, is, is, that, um, is that part of the legacy, the international legacy of President Obama, would you say? Well, of course, it's part of his legacy. I mean, he's expanded these illegal drone strikes. These are extrajudicial assassinations. In fact, not only of foreigners, but also of American citizens abroad. I think this should raise some constitutional hackles. Uh, you know, he has presided over at least one uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, dangerous war, the war in Libya. Uh, I think uh, we need to consider the fact that uh, too much is made of Obama's personality or temperament mm. and of his Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, we forget that the United States is not a humanitarian power. It is a geopolitical power. Uh, it, you know, uses humanitarian language when its own interests are at stake. Otherwise, it's quite silent. It's silent when the Palestinians are being bombed in Gaza. It's silent when the people of Bahrain were being overrun. And it was indeed silent when the American uh, ally, the Rwandan army, sent in their proxy M23 into eastern Congo. So, you know, let's not uh, start this conversation with the assumption that the United States somehow is a humanitarian country. It is a geopolitical country. It has its own interests, and Mr. Obama was the steward of those interests. BJ, because you bring up you know, a lot of people's criticisms of the promises and then what it was like in reality in terms of how he implemented his foreign policy, Tariq Radi uh, also commented on Palestine specifically, but making kind of broader points. L listen to this video. I am incredibly disappointed by President Obama's stance on Palestine during his eight-year term. But by no means am I surprised, given the fact that he is the commander-in-chief of a country that exports violence all over the world. His ascendancy to power may have struck our soft spot for multicultural liberalism, but at the end of the day, in Palestinian history, he'll be remembered for giving $38 billion in military aid to Israel, the largest aid package in U.S. history. While he may have entered the White House more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause than his predecessors, he most certainly will not be leaving that way. So I saw you nodding a lot. I mean, whether it's, you know, Palestine or Iraq, or, you know, what do you make of that disconnect between uh, what he promised and what uh, happened? I think, uh, go I, ahead. I, I think, think Tariq has it uh, completely correct on this. I, I, don't, I wouldn't disagree with anything. I'd just like to amplify what he said or maybe generalize it. It's not only the $38 billion over 10 years, which is the, basically the arms giveaway to the Israeli military, but let's consider that in his eight years in office, President Obama has presided over the selling of more arms than any president uh, before him. 
Uh, he's, uh, under him, about $600 billion of arms were, sp were spent, uh, were, were basically delivered of course, to, around to the many world. countries, to Half Saudi Arabia, to, to many countries. It wasn't just Israel, as you yeah. point out. Go ahead. And I think on, on yeah, top of that, one of the, one Vijay, of the, Vijay, just one second, please. One of the things that I think is, is curious, on top of how different that is from what Obama said as a candidate, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, there's a big gap between Obama the candidate and Obama the president. But what's curious is, despite all the lessons of the war on terror, all of which have been negative, uh, everything the United States has done, uh, whether it's drones or airstrikes or invasions or nation building or what have you, uh, has failed pretty miserably. What's, what's curious is even if you are a geopolitical power, why aren't you doing what's in your own national interest? If, if mm -hmm. curbing terrorism and controlling the Middle East is actually in the United States interest, we haven't been going about it very well. Mm -hmm. So. Hi. Yeah, I mean, I think um, definitely. I mean, we saw it in his um, we saw it in his speech earlier that this is ushering in a new era of American leadership. And again, I mean, with with the Bush years, a very sort of muscular um, military policy. And yet, you know, you have um, like we've mentioned the sale of arms, the um, kind of covert drone strikes. Um, and I would say, you know, extending even even to Africa, the disconnect between the rhetoric on human rights, the rhetoric that he even spoke to with, with Africans on, you know, we don't need strong men, we need strong institutions. And yet the support for um, regimes in Egypt, like you mentioned, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. there's oh, still, again, the, look at this, Karen. Just, 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 just to compliment what you're saying, Ibit says, I thought he'd help get rid of dictators in Africa, mm -hmm. like in Uganda, but sadly it came to naught. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a lot of expectation. That's regime change. Mm -hmm. uh, not that the U.S. hasn't doubled in that from right. time to time. Right. But expecting <laughs> long-term leaders in Africa to step down because there's a president that has African ancestry, is that mm -hmm. too much of a stretch? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was, if you look back on it. I mean, yeah. even right now, we have dual crises in South Sudan, in Sudan, the DRC. If we go back to South Sudan, that was actually one of the sort of flagship accomplishments um, under the Obama, Obama administration mm -hmm. um, and under Hillary Clinton, the creation of the world's newest country in 2011. Um, fast forward six years later, and the country is on the brink of complete collapse and complete chaos. And I think, unfortunately, with the, um, the Trump campaign, the Hillary Clinton campaign, we didn't have a real robust uh, discussion about nation building, about what our role is in um, helping nations. Does nation building work? Should America be in the business of nation building? If you look at South Sudan, that's evidence to say, maybe not. Mm -hmm. you know. Our American president's just bad at foreign policy. No, it's just really hard. <laughs> I think they're limited, right? Uh, I, the, the, one of the most important things to understand about the world is that it's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. And, Nobody likes it. And, <laughs> you know, not only is it very difficult to understand what's going on, but right. it's even more difficult to try to program outcomes around the world. I, we can't even control our own economy. How are we going to control Iraq's or Syria's? We, we couldn't agree on a, a set of national institutions today if we had to do it again from scratch in America. How do we expect it? to do that in another country at the point of a gun. And then it's, also, it's not realistic. We're, we're living in a more yet, multipolar yeah. world. We're also having, you know, the ascendance of China, the ascendance of Russia, the ascendance of, you know, these um, so-called sort of global south or other countries that are kind of creating, you know, more geopolitical challenges well, for, you know, unchallenged American power. And, and you know, Vijay, I saw you were laughing uh, throughout some of that commentary there. I, I, I know this isn't news to you, but Allah be Michael, Kind of pointing to this fact, a kind of sad reality. Sadly, after eight years, Africa realized that the color of POTUS does not mean development <laughs> for Africa. Why are you laughing, Vijay? Well, look, I'm laughing because I, I agree with what people are saying, and, and it's almost a relief to hear uh, other people saying that uh, in the United <laughs> States. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a curious moment uh, when Karen uses the word, we are in a multipolar world. That's a relief for me. You know, uh, look, the, the Obama administration uh, had to deal with the emergence again of Russia and China, and I think handled it quite badly. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the move to push NATO eastward, threatening Russia, you know, after the deal that was made uh, when Germany was united, the deal made with the Soviets at the time was that NATO would not move east of the German border. And yet NATO has crept closer and closer to, to Russia, uh, which r has made Russia defensive and aggressive at the same time. 
And on the other side of Eurasia, the United States has basically challenged China's right uh, in the South China Sea. So you have these vestiges of the Cold War, this enormous infrastructure of bases, basically used to try and hem in powers that are re-emerging uh, in the world. I agree with Trevor. It's hard to change the world. So mm -hmm. the question is, do you change the world uh, by being aggressive, by demanding that people live the way you do, by bombing them, or do you allow them to change themselves at their own rhythm? And I think the United States needs to come to terms with the fact that the world is going to change at, at its own rhythm. You can't bomb the world into making them consumers of Coca-Cola uh, and of, uh, you know, oh. of Chevrolet cars. Uh, I guess at the same time, as, as someone who's a bit of a millennial, as as we talk about, as as much as things sh stay change, they also stay the same. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the approaches that we used in the Cold War was trying to counterbalance, mm -hmm. you know, Russia and China mm -hmm. and influence in the global south. To a certain extent, you see some of these um, these being echoed in in the war on terror. So again, bringing up um, mm -hmm. Africa again, you know, funneling millions and millions of dollars to dictators in the uh, event that they will help us in peacekeeping in Somalia or help us in counter terror or in uh, Europe. Um, help to contain the migrant crisis, well, that sort of thing. Well, one thing that didn't stay the same, I mean, as you're talking about things staying the same, uh, as I'm sure all, all our guests know, is, is Iran. And a lot of people, you know, commenting to us, Femi, about mm -hmm. uh, whether they think it was a positive change, whether it's going to be a lasting change moving forward under a, a Trump administration. Nima sent us this video comment. Take a listen to this. The most important impact the Iran deal and, like, the Obama administration in general had... Uh, and ordinary lives of Iranians, including me, was that it gave us hope. Like before Iran deal, there was always this fear of war, fear of crippling sanctions. And after the Iran deal, like young people started to feel more secure to, and they were feeling that there is a future for them inside Iran. What do you think of that, Trevor, when you hear that? Uh, you know, that I, I'm not surprised because I've seen some polling data from Iran that suggests that Iranians really do want a better relationship with the United States, despite what you might hear some Republicans in the United States saying about how Iran feels, will especially younger Iranians. Will Obama be remembered positively for his change? Uh, it's going to depend on how long the Iran nuclear deal lasts, I guess. Uh, and I think that's in some great question right now. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't bet that it's going to last forever. See, Michael Day. But, but it's who, impossible. Who, it, yes, we take. You, sorry, you go I first. just want to go say it's, it's impossible to actually roll back on the Iran deal. If you look at it from the point of view of Europe, which is the United States' major ally on this deal, um, you know, the Europeans have found that as a consequence of the policy with Russia, that their access to Russian energy sources has been basically uh, cut, cut back. And because of the war in Libya, uh, the cheapest oil and the best oil coming from Africa has been cut back. So the Europeans are, were eager to have this deal in order to have Iranian energy sources and supplies uh, enter, in, enter Europe. So I'm very confident that the Europeans are not going to join any kind of belligerence from the Trump administration to roll back on this deal, which I think is perhaps the one positive thing out of the Obama administration. Jump in. So that it doesn't, if we're talking about relationships and, and your relationships, there are some positive things, you know, I mean, we could talk about the, the Cuba, the reset with Cuba relations. Um, we could also talk about the, the landmark climate um, agreement uh, around the, you know, with multiple countries mm -hmm. around the world. That again, you know, perhaps some would say perhaps if they're more symbolic or not, but again, I mean, that there, these were hugely you know, consequential and historic um, moments in the Obama presidency. Mm -hmm. Michael's listening very intently. Michael Days is listening very intently. You wrote a biography about the legacy of President Obama. It's a cele cele I can't say it now, celebratory look back at the last eight years. You don't spend too much time focusing on foreign policy. Is that because you don't think it matters for Americans? Mm -hmm. Why do you make that no, choice? No, it definitely does matter yeah. for America. But I think one of your guests did say, you know, foreign affairs is very complicated. And uh, the, the one thing we took we the do easy know road, Michael Day. Like, I'm not. I'm not researching that. I'm not <laughs> researching the world. Uh, 
you know, some of a lot of it's going to depend on on what the incoming pre how the incoming president views the world, and he views the world very differently from the outgoing president. I feel like the uh, the comment about Cuba is is uh, was an important comment because uh, while uh, uh, the incoming president has been fairly stern on on that breakthrough. Uh, the American business industry is 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 very strong on relationships uh, uh, with Cuba. And I think that will that uh -huh. will. Let, uh, will let rule me throw, let me throw this at you because this is something that straddles both foreign policy and domestic policy, and that is immigration. What is your scorecard for President Obama, Michael Days, on immigration? Because then I want to play uh, a, a comment back here, which is more critical. A lot, a lot of good intent, a lot of executive orders, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the Dream Act in which, you mm -hmm. know, young people who were in this country, before, in the United States before they turned 16, were able to um, uh, to get uh, Social Security cards and work permits. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that appears to be a momentary thing. Um, what has to happen and really has to the, the, the and it's been tried for for many many years now there's really got to be legislation that comes through congress mm -hmm. that that creates a path for right. for the new immigrants Let me bring to our country elizabeth metillo and and she has a very big connection to why immigration is so important to her have a listen to her in 2008 i campaigned for barack obama's presidential campaign because i believed that he would eventually deliver on his promise for immigration reform and the dream act However, to my disappointment, he never did. And instead, he reported a record number of immigrants, um, including my uncle. And although today I qualify for the Fair Action for Childhood Arrivals, a program that the president gets praise for enacting, his administration has been threatening to deny me DACA for the past seven months. So for me um, and my family, the Roman administration's legacy is one that's filled with broken promises and injustice for the immigrant community. Uh, however, I still believe that there's a chance that he can turn that legacy around um, before it's too late and before he turns over his deportation network to the Trump administration. You can hear the sadness in her voice, can't you there? This both sounds like m maybe in this last month something could happen. Is that possible? I mean, he, the president's doing a lot. In the last couple of days, he, he's, there's Atlantic drilling. Okay, that's sorted for the next few years. Um, lots of prisoners have been released. It was just like he is, yeah. he's on a he's mission. He's got a bucket list and he's trying yeah. to get to the last few yeah. things on the bucket list. But I think if you look back historically, things that presidents do in the last few weeks are the mm -hmm. easiest things to undo because they're sort of slapdash, uh, yeah. number one. And, and number two, too, the bigger point is the president gets way too much credit and way too much blame for everything that happens during their administration. And so in this case, you know, he had a, a Congress who was dead set against the kind of immigration reform that your young speaker there yeah. would like to see. Yeah. It's not going to happen with Republicans anytime soon. And I think the broader part... Which she alluded to. Which she alluded to. You know, and I think the even bigger tragedy is that the United States could actually use immigration as an incredibly positive tool of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And we've just been missing that opportunity for years and years, mm -hmm. but especially since the Syrian civil war. And I think that's just, that's gonna be a negative stain on his legacy. And, and Sarah, when you talk about negative stains on the legacy, I saw you were nodding. I just wanna quickly bring you in because Meneleni is saying Obama dignified the US image after illegitimate wars, improved social care at home, but failed in bids to end wars, closed Guantanamo. You just heard what uh, our, you know, our uh, viewer said about immigration, is it hands tied? I mean, what is this? I mean, the deportation question is the part of that that really gets to be like, yes, obviously this Congress wasn't going to pass comprehensive in immigration reform, but Obama sort of tightened up the deportations, giving Republicans, again, sort of what they want, right? They want increased enforcement and we're going to, you know, get rid of the bad people. And did that preemptively without getting anything in return. And so instead we've got this, as she said, ramped up deportation machine that is all ready to be handed over to somebody who ran a campaign on deporting people. Mm. Yeah. Let me just remind you, can I remember June the 4th, 2009, this was a speech that was made in Cairo by President Obama. I'm just taking a little snippet of it to play to you. Have a listen. I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world, one based on mutual interest and mutual respect, and one based upon the truth that America and Islam are not exclusive and need not be in competition. BJ, where are we right now with that? <laughs> well, we're very far away from that. But even at that point, when Mr. Obama went to Cairo University to deliver that speech. It's, a, by the way, beautiful room in Cairo University where he spoke. Uh, even when he gave that speech, 
But there were a lot of eyes rolling in West Asia and in North Africa. After all, the United States' closest ally in the region is Saudi Arabia. And everybody knows uh, you know, what its history is and, and the role it's played uh, for the United States in the region. So until there's actually an unraveling or a shift, a slow shift in the kind of relations that the United States has in the region, you know, speeches like that are not going to have the kind of impact that they should. Now, no doubt, uh, he made this speech as the antidote uh, to the Iraq war. But of course, given that the uh, policies of the Iraq war and, and in, uh, in its aftermath uh, were not unraveled, uh, it became hard to take Mr. Obama seriously. I mean, I know that yeah. I would like to believe that he had the best of intentions in everything he does. One always hopes that for human beings. But certainly the policies were basically a carryover from the Bush administration. Michael Denzel, Michael Denzel Smith. What do you want to add? Yeah, it's important to, like, when you're hearing that, to, to note that George W. Bush was saying the same thing about the U.S. relationship to Islam and Muslims ac across the country. Um, and he he enacted these wars that Obama inherited. And it is still real that the no-fly list is real, the kill list is real, and Obama has, like, unilaterally been able to decide who we kill overseas. And because he's been a, such a likable Democrat, a charismatic uh, figure yeah. that liberals have, have rallied behind, we haven't had a massive critique of that. We haven't seen a sort of anti-war peace movement uh, in this in this country the same way that we've seen in reaction to other uh, issues. Um, and and because and, and in that we like we're not just handing over the deportation machine, we're handing over a, a killing machine overseas to someone that ha uh, th that we all recognize. Um, shouldn't be it we shouldn't have these types of powers well, well, Michael, but because we we put a friendly face on it we're okay with it michael i'm i'm so glad you brought that up because of course it's not just uh those policies from the bush era that obama's continued or expanded a lot of critics online telling us uh, you know the drone warfare and and many other things uh also domestic issues a lot of people don't know the muslim registry that a lot of people are talking about in trump's era, you know, has existed and did exist through Obama, Obama's uh, administration. He didn't suspend it until 2011. So with all that in mind, you know, I'm wondering, uh, DJ, Kevin McSpadden is saying, restraint that is misconstrued as weakness, allowing other countries to test limits, kind of summing up Obama's, I guess, approach to some of this. Syria, he says, will be the black eye of his legacy. In light of everything we just discussed, do you think that's true? Uh, well, I mean, I think in some uh, quarters it will be the black eye and people will point to the fact that he had drawn a red line and then didn't act uh, based on this red line, namely the use of chemical weapons. But uh, I, I see this slightly differently. I see this as a situation where uh, he was essentially hemmed in uh, by the rising uh, ambitions of Russia, uh, by Russian entry into Syria. You know, the fact that the Russians entered militarily in September 2015 basically ended all question of regime change inside Syria. So what is called Mr. Obama leading from behind, as if this is, you know, a well-worked-out Obama doctrine, is actually the reality of the United States having to come to terms with well, the fact that there are other powers in the world that, it, that are constraining its ability to move. Yeah. And I think that's something yeah. that people need to come to terms with. Yeah, yeah. To totally agree. I think you see over eight years Obama learning on the job. Um, he didn't have a clear, you know, he had a lot of happy thoughts, but he didn't have a clear, you know, theory of victory when he started. I think now he has much uh, smaller goals than he started with. But he also has a better idea that restraint is, is a better approach mm -hmm. than, than intervention. The thing that's sad to me, though, is that uh, the clip you played uh, where he's talking about how we couldn't do Syria, it was, there was no way we could do that at a reasonable price, it's going to be a mess. Why did not he, he apply that same logic to Afghanistan and Iraq? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's n no difference to me there. I mean, even that ceasefire that we just saw Russia you know, agree on, America didn't even know. It seemed like the Obama administration didn't even know that it had happened between you know, Russia and Iraq. In the last think, 30 yeah. seconds of this show, That's out of it. 10 marks for foreign policy, Trevor? Five. Could have been worse. Karen? <laughs> Um, I'd say a six. VJ? About one or two. Ooh! <laughs> Ooh. Ah. Michael? I'm a very difficult grader. Michael, <laughs> marks out of ten for foreign policy. Incomplete. Okay, uh, Michael Denzel Smith. 
I'd say about a three. Oh my oh, goodness. Ooh. Generous. Uh, Sarah, you're going to get the great Four. average up. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, that's uh, yeah, President this. Obama's foreign policy mm -hmm. legacy. Thank you guys for being part of this conversation. Thank you, community, as well. You will see us always online. Hashtag AJStream. Take care.